Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started, folks. Good evening, everyone. It's great to see you here um, for our even fall service as we continue these services. Uh, let's pray, and we'll get started, and I will uh, turn it over to Byron to get us um, back into some hymnody, hymnology, if you will. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, so very much for your wisdom and in bringing this um, service about, and especially what we are called to do, which is to, um, <coughs> excuse me, to uh, grow closer together, to have a bond in you, to um, recognize uh, what it means to be a church and how significant that is in the world, uh, to recognize that we are indeed the light of the world and the, the darker the darkness, the brighter the light. And I just pray that we will um, enjoy the time that we have together, that we will enjoy the, the time of singing and learning about hymns, that we will enjoy the time of prayer um, later on and the communion that we will take and then the, uh, the, the time that we spend in the Word. Lord, we know that you bless us when we turn to you completely and entirely. And I pray that that will be what is on every person's heart tonight, that we will be wholly transfixed on you, that we will recognize that you are our unity, you are our strength, and that as we will learn later on, that we will strive, and that's what it takes is striving, that we will strive to have the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ, the spirit of Christ, and the purpose of Christ, and may that bring us close together and as, as we have that common bond in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> and with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Brother Byron. You can um, uh, continue to elucidate us as far as these great hymns. Good evening. So as I look at you, I realize that, that you've probably walked roughly the same road that I have through church music in the last 30, 40, 50, 60 years, something like that. My memory, I was born in 1961, so my memory of church music, uh, you know, where I was really focused on it, probably began in the 70s. Do you guys remember the 70s? What a wonderful time. <laughs> but not necessarily with church music, um, right? We were still all singing from hymnals. I don't think projectors had even been invented yet. I mean, maybe they were somewhere, but even in school settings, we did barely had any sort of projectors. And so we had a canon of established church music. I know there were Christians writing songs. Uh, there were Christians recording and making albums and touring and, and all that sort of things. We just didn't know how to get their music into the church. And, and some of their music wasn't appropriate for a church setting, right? I mean, I don't know if you remember the same names that I do, like Larry Norman and Randy Stonehill or who else were in the 70s? Um, the Imperials, pardon? Second chapter of Acts. Those so they, they were songs that would not necessarily have fit in a church setting, even if they were, you know, well-written songs. Um, Bill Gaither was writing music that was starting to work its way into hymnals that he was publishing and that sort of thing. So, um, so in the 70s and 80s, the church was kind of, and again, this is just my take on my perceptions, living it and looking back on it, kind of at this crossroads of like, we know there's new music out there, but how do we get it into our church? And it seemed like we resolved that little issue with um, scripture songs, where we kind of moved away from the hymns that had the content and were traditional, and younger people were drawn, the, you know, the Jesus movement and that sort of thing, to, to songs that were just scripture. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. Nice songs. Uh, they didn't necessarily have to rhyme. They were literally just taking the verses and sending them to music. Sometimes as my wife are going, and I are going through little devotionals together, I mean, we're reading the devotional going like, and we just start singing the song that we remember from, we were married at the Christian Life Center in 1991. So in the late 80s, we were singing those songs there. The, um, the, part of the trouble with those songs, and, and they served a wonderful purpose of helping us to memorize scripture. Part of the trouble with those songs was they... They helped form this genre of music that we've all heard referred to as the 7-Eleven songs. There's seven words that we repeat 11 times. 
and that was just, it was an insult to a, a good effort. But listen, if they're not in a hymnal and you're going to sing them and there's no projectors, they got to be easy, right? I mean, that's just what we had to do back then. So um, by the mid-80s or late 80s, I'm just trying to, you know, as I've been planning for this, trying to remember wh what my wife and I were singing as we were courting and, you know, and going to church. Um, Lord, I Lift Your Name on High had come out in the late 80s. So that was, we were starting to move toward like, hey, this is a pretty decent song. It covers a lot of stuff and is singable and uh, shout to the Lord. That's still one that we sing here. The one that we sang this morning, um, we worship and adore you, bowing down before you. It's a simple chorus. Eh, maybe not, you know, you don't want to do it every week, but it's a nice one to sing. And those are the songs that were starting to come out then. Better than the 7-Eleven songs, but still not with the content of the hymns. And in 1987, um, Stuart Townen had graduated Sussex University in England or something. I don't really know much about their school systems over there and what qualifies people to do what. Maybe I don't understand it very well here either, but he became a youth pastor in the Church of Christ of God or something like that somewhere in England. And as he was sorting through music for their congregation um, and longing for modern music with more content, as I, get, as I understand, he just kind of gave up and said, I'll just write my own. It's not there. We've moved from something where there was content. We've moved out of that because people don't want the, the links to the past or whatever. So I'll just start writing my own. And so tonight we're going to go through one of the very first of the Stuart Townend songs. So I'm going to pass you the song. Uh, and there's scripture on one side and the words to the song on the other side. So I want you to go to the side that has the scripture. Don't cheat. Don't cheat and go to the other side. Go to the side that just has the scriptures because... The man started with scripture, and he wrote a song using just like scripture. It's just fantastic. And no offense to anybody else that writes songs, you know, out of you know wonderful rhyme schemes or clever singable patterns or whatever. This this was a thinking man's woman's song. So, Pastor Kirby can help me with a stack again. Start with the scripture reference side. Don't cheat. Does yours start with the Galatians 6.14 at the top? John 3.16 at the top. Okay, then I have an old copy from my own, so it's in it, but further on down. So I'm going to need one of those copies myself. Thank you. All right, I'm going to actually take the time. I'm sorry, Kirby, if this cuts into your, your uh, Philippians time. We don't allow, um, <laughs> you know, we have a strict schedule. Here. But I'm going, to, I'm going to read through all these scriptures with you so that when we get to the song, which we might actually read tonight instead of singing it, we're going to sing it next week in church. All right? So I, shall we stand up and read the scriptures? Let's stand up for this. All right. I'll read the reference, and then you can join in on reading the verse with me. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Psalm 22, 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Hebrews 2:10. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. First Peter 2.24 
He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Luke 23, 35. And the people stood by, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. Mark 15, 34. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? John 19, 30. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Galatians 6, 14. But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Matthew 20, 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many, 1 Timothy 2, 6, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. And you may be seated. So this, I believe, was the first of Stuart Townend's songs, and he has gone on to collaborate famously with whom? Keith and Kristen Getty. So in Christ Alone and dozens of other songs, of which we have probably, what, 20 or 25 in our database, The Power of the Cross, and, and uh, interesting the way they collaborate is very different from Fanny Crosby, who wrote poems, and somebody else set them to music. They share music and poems and ideas together and kind of write the songs, working it out together. But this first one he did himself. I, I actually brought a hymnal, um, Hymns Modern and Ancient. And for, for a while, when we had these songs, we didn't have them in hymn form with like, Sonia knows what I mean, with notes where you could actually sing the parts and stuff like that. And somebody took a bunch of these Getty songs and Townend songs and put them in hymn form so that we could, at least the, those of us on the stage, have notes to follow, which is very important when you're singing to know what you're singing. Okay. I remember the first time I heard this song. I don't know, Kirby, if you remember the, the, the man who was in charge of the youth group, the first talent show that we did here at New Hope. Yeah, and it wasn't me. It was a, there was a youth leader, I think Justin something, his wife, Van, Van de Kirk, and his wife, Erin, and they had, they had graduated, I think, from Dort College, and we had um, Travis and Sheena Patton, and, and the, the two girls sang this the first time I ever heard it, and I was just, I hadn't heard anything like this. It sounds like a hymn, but it was new. So this time, I'll read it. I'll pause on little things. Um, I'm not going to dig real deep since we've already read all the scriptures. And then next Sunday, we'll sing this together. It's helpful to have a piano when we're singing it. It's, you guys know math, right? How many fourths does it take to make a whole? Four. Stuart Townend was able to put five fourths in one measure. So every single one of these measures has five beats, which is just a little different. Um, it's, it's, it'd be a little tricky for me to sing with you, actually. It'd be much easier for you and me to play than to just sing. So, You may flip your page, yes. Thank you. <laughs> how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. And if you went back, you know, I'm going to let you actually keep these papers. You don't have to turn them back in um, and, and match up the scriptures with these. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. And I can remember I probably had sung that 10 times. Like, what is this many sons to glory business? Right, and it's from Hebrews 2. We had just read it over there a minute ago, Hebrews 2, 10. 
uh, the found, uh, anyway. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. I don't know of another song that gets that truth that vividly. I hear my mocking voice. When I'm singing that at the piano, right about then, I'll be dropping out, and there will be tears pouring down my face. That's a great line. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. And then we'll repeat that last little part. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. And that was kind of, as I understand, the beginning of the modern era of writing hymns, at least on the British side of the, the, the lake, um, of writing hymns that are, are new but sound old. Stuart Townen. Uh, 95, I think, 93, 95, something like that. Although it might have taken a while to get published and get out to the, the greater Christian community. Might have taken us till 2005, I don't know. Okay. Thank you, Byron. I can, I can remember that, um, that Sunday when they sang that. And all of these years, I thought that was an ancient tune. I thought that was an ode from medieval times or from yes. the 1600s. That's the way it came across. Uh, and to just say it was, it was Stuart, is it Tomlin or uh, Townsend? Tom. Ta ta Townen or, or whatever. But, but nonetheless, uh, I, I had no idea he wrote that. that that's amazing to, to have that. Wow, what a, what a wonderful grasp of uh, scripture to put it into psalm. We have truly been blessed by, um, by the, the way that these new songs are coming out. And what a place to come from, from, from England, which has turned so... Um, a call to the gospel and Ireland, which is so the same way to, to see these amazing songs coming out of there. It's, uh, it's really wonderful. Well, I'm going to read a little bit from the Old Testament. Um, Will came in just a little bit too late for me to dump this on him. Um, I didn't even know you were coming tonight, Will. So uh, uh, if you would, let's turn to the 133rd Psalm. You see, I knew I was reading tonight, so it's a nice short one. Um, 133rd Psalm, it fits in very closely with, um, with what we are going to be talking about in Philippians tonight, and that's the, the brothers and sisters who dwell in unity and how sweet that is and how important that is. This is another one of the Song of Ascents from David. And they're just three verses, but they are such beautiful verses. So let me read these words out of the Old Testament. Uh, they don't require an awful lot of commentary because there's going to be more commentary from Paul and Philippians along this way. But David writes this, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. Is that not a descriptive verse? Can you see that in your minds? It was a special oil. It was put together with a special formula that was not to be duplicated anyplace else except to anoint the, 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 um, the priest. And it was uh, scented in a way and... It was uh, used in an anointing for the purpose that God had called Aaron and the priest. And I don't think that we are to consider that just to be Aaron himself individually, but, but this was something that would be done to all the priests um, as anointing uh, to uh, conduct their um, particular task. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. The dew of Hermon. 
Hermon is a mountain that's about 10,000 feet in elevation. And I am told that during the summer months, everything turns brown in Israel, that um, the, it goes a long period of time without any rain. But because of the height of Mount Hermon, there are sections of Hermon that are green all year round, even in the midst of summer. And, and I am also told that they would take pilgrimages there, actually, um, to enjoy the, the green that was, that was there. And now it's the dew that is on Hermon. The, even when it didn't rain, there was a dew on Hermon in the summer. Uh, and that, of course, is being projected as the blessing of God that comes upon Mount Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Uh, what a beautiful uh, um, uh, psalm that is. How graphically picture, uh, it starts with the blessing of God and it ends with the blessing of God. And brings a very close important association between brothers and sisters that gather together just like we are now. Um, 3,000 years ago, David wrote this, a little bit over. Um, people, the people of God have been gathering together that long and gathering together in unity. So, turn with me, if you would, to the book of Philippians. Starting a new chapter tonight, second chapter. Wow, what a chapter this is. Can't wait to get to some of the, the things that are brought out in this chapter. We're going to be looking just at the first four verses tonight. Let me go ahead and read them, then we'll ask the Lord to bless um, our understanding. Reading from the second chapter. So here now God's word as it is given to us in the book of Philippians, reading from the second chapter, the first four verses. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And may the Lord bless this reading of his word. Let's ask him to bring it alive. Lord, we know that this is something we desperately need. Every church needs this. Uh, this ranks among churches, among the people of the church, as one of the most important things, aside from the gospel, that we strive for, which is unity, brotherhood deep and compassionate love for each other. So I pray that these words will resonate in each one of our hearts this evening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as I just said in my prayer, that is our focus tonight is the unity of the church, the unity of the body of Christ. And as vital as, uh, as the gospel is, it is the key to what we do. When we gather together as a church, as a body of Christ, um, unity ranks high. Of course, it's secondary to our calling to share the gospel, but it ver ranks very high as uh, an importance in what the church should do. Jesus talked about unity. He wanted his church to be unified. In his high priestly prayer, he said this, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That, of course, is us. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That's Jesus' formula for church unity, that we would be in him, that he would be in us, that we would be in the Father, the Father would be in us, the Spirit would be in us, and we would be in the Spirit. Okay, that's a wonderful uh, uh, plan for for unity, Paul is going to articulate a little bit more elsewhere to the Corinthians. He says this, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. I could choose dozens of verses in the New Testament and the letters of Paul calling for the unity of the body. As important as it is, 
it still is something that eludes most congregations. It eludes most churches. Most churches are, are, are embroiled in, in all kinds of discord and uh, disagreements. And so it is something we have to strive for. But Paul is going to put it in such a powerful way, I think, this evening. So I hope it will indeed resonate to us. Now, where we are in, in this book, of course, or in the, the study of Philippians, moving now into the second chapter, Paul started out by pretty much just saying, this is why the church at Philippi is such a source of joy to me. And then he switched gears and he began to talk about himself and he talked about the imprisonment that he was in. But he was also still joyful even in that situation because the gospel was going forward and Christ was being exalted. To me to live as Christ, to die as gain. That put it in its perspective. And, and, and even though there were some people working against him, he didn't care because the gospel was moving ahead. Now, most recently, he, he made a statement that flows into this one. So, uh, since the opening words of our text bring that into it, let's go ahead and dive into the text. And that will all become evident to us. Because he starts out with this verse. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy. That, though, he, he lists those four blessings. But notice how he starts it out. So the New American Standard uses the word therefore. And so what that is doing is bringing the subject that we were talking about last time we met directly into this conversation. Now, of course, what we were talking about then is when Jesus made the, the, really the kind of stunning statement, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then he goes on to say, so that I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And when we talked about that, we recognized that he was touching on the idea of the unity, the requirement of unity. He said we would find unity in our work, we would find unity in our striving, we would find unity in our suffering. Well, he's going to articulate that a little bit more completely for us this evening. But I want you to notice the way that he words this when he says, if there is any encouragement and so forth. He's not saying that this is some kind of a rhetorical question or, that, or this is a hypothetical situation. That it, If this was a situation that occurred, then this is what would happen. No. Basically, we could reword that if we wanted to and say, since it is surely an encouragement that you have in Christ. In, in other words... These are the marks of what it means to be a Christian. These are the blessings that Christ gives us as Christians. And Paul is saying that because of these blessings, we should all be striving for unity. And, and he puts it in a, a very straightforward way. So let's take a look at these four blessings individually and we will see what he means. So if there is any encouragement in Christ... Now, that word encouragement can be translated in several different ways. I agree with those that say it should be translated as comfort. If there's any comfort in Christ, if there's any comfort that you have as a believer, as a born-again new creation in Christ, the word is actually very close to the word paraclete that we translate as the comforter. And so if there's any comfort that you have received out of your relationship with Christ, then for goodness sakes, if you are blessed to that degree to have a relationship with Christ, you should be striving for unity. These are all blessings that are going to point to why unity should be important for every single one of us and not to, uh, to, to almost live in a world of disagreement and discord, how easy it is to bring divisions up. He goes on and says, the second blessing, if there is any comfort from love, and that word, even though it's translated comfort, it is a word that means any solace, any, any consolation. And of course, the love that he's talking about is the love of Christ. 
It is the love of Christ that completes us, that fills us, that inundates us, that binds us together as, as a church. And basically what he's saying is, are, are you comforted at all in Christ? Is there any solace, the fact that Jesus Christ went to the cross and died for you so that your sins could be forgiven, so that you could be atoned for, so that you could have the righteousness of Christ, so that you could stand in the presence of God? Does that bring you any comfort? Well, if it does bring you comfort, then you should be concerned about the unity of the church. You should be striving for that unity. He goes on and says, any participation in the spirits. I'm not quite sure why the ESV translates that as participation. It's a word that we're familiar with. It's the word koinonia. And koinonia is one of the reasons that we're here. It's the fellowship. I mean, going back to Acts 2, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, koinonia. And so if, if the word participation can be used here, it's if you have the blessing of participating in the koinonia, the fellowship of believers. If you have been pulled out of the darkness of this world and, and your small-mindedness, and it's your lostness, and now you have relationship with other brothers and sisters, my goodness, how you have been blessed by this. And so therefore, this is a reason, this is a mark of a Christian, a reason that you should be striving for, um, for unity. And the fourth one is affection and sympathy. If you have any affection, if you are blessed with the compassion, the word affection is an interesting one. It is not affection. It actually is the word for bowels, okay, for, for your gut. And in the, that sounds kind of weird at first, you know, you, you know, that it would be stated that way, but not so much if you recognize that in the ancient world, the seat of the emotions was not the heart. They wouldn't talk about, you know, my heart loves. It's my bowels love. <laughs> my, I love in my gut, you know. And, and when you have the strong emotions, don't you feel it in your gut? Have you ever heard people say, I'm so much in love, I, I'm sick, or I get butterflies in my stomach? Well, that's the seat of the emotions. And so that's what they're saying. If you are blessed with this emotional bond with these other brothers and sisters, if you have sympathy, and the word sympathy is very similar to what it means uh, in English, a display of concern over another's misfortune, to have pity, to have mercy, to have compassion. So basically what he is saying is if you have a great blessing where your heart is compassionate for those in your midst who need your sympathy, if, if, if for those who, who, who are in need and, and your heart breaks, brothers and sisters, that's a blessing. It is a blessing not to be totally and completely consumed by ourselves and only think about ourselves. It is a blessing to have a heart of compassion. And we look to the people, not just the people in this church, not just the people in our sphere, but the people in Haiti. We spent this evening praying for people that most of you don't know. We have a heart for them. That's a blessing. And if you've got that, it's a sign that Jesus has changed your life, changed your heart. If you have this blessing, then you should be striving for unity. And that's what Paul says. Paul puts it in that context. Now, brothers and sisters, you've heard me speak of the implicit inverse quite a bit when we talk about the Ten Commandments. And the way that Paul frames this is that these are blessings that are indicative of what it means to be a Christian. And so, therefore, if you have those blessings and you are not concerned in the unity of the church, then you are committing an egregious sin. That's the way he puts it. That's how serious this is as far as he is concerned. Because you have all of the blessings that lead to those who are going to strive and do everything that they possibly can to put the things aside that will call division and to focus on the unity of the church. That's the reason that unity should be pursued. Paul's going to add one of his own in the next verse. Second verse, he says, complete my joy. Now, we've talked about that joy that Paul has. He has joy in the, in the church at Philippi. He has joy in the fact the gospel is going forth. But here we get a hint of what we're going to pick up a little bit later in the book, that, that there are some undercurrents, that, that there are some people that there's some disunity in. 
And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, I am so sensitive to this as your pastor, as your shepherd. When I detect disunity, discord, uh, uh, things that are, are, are surfacing in and amongst us, well, they're things that have to be addressed. They're things that have to be looked at because that disunity, that discord will, will turn into a cancer that can tear the church apart. So Paul is interested in addressing this. And he says, this is the icing on the cake for me. Yes, I have got joy for, in all different ways, but put the cherry on top of my, of my Sunday here um, because that will complete it if indeed I see you unified in the way that you should be. So Paul is going to go on and give four essential aspects. This is his formula for church unity. The, the things, actually four uh, directives and then two verses uh, uh, when he talks about selflessness and humility. But let's just take a look at those four directives. Complete my joy by being of the same mind. To be of the same mind, when it talks about the mind here, the mind is where your opinions are, where your thoughts are, where your ideas are, where your judgments are. Uh, that it, it's the mind in that sense. And to be of the same mind is to have minds that think the same way that are on the same page, on the same wavelength, in the same groove. We're, 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 we're like people. Our minds are in the, the same uh, um, basic agreements. It speaks of minds that are in harmony. But brothers and sisters, there is something that is so essential when we're talking about unity. It's not enough for us just to have minds that are on the same wavelength. It's not enough for us just to have the same values. It's not enough for us to think the same way, have the same worldview. I mean, social clubs have these things. What Paul wants the church to be is to have the mind of Christ. That is essential. It cannot be the mind of the world and have unity within the church. In fact, the mind of the world is going to do everything to disrupt the church rather than to add to that unity. In the fifth verse, we're going to see him say, we'll get to it next time we meet, but this is what he's going to say. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So the mind that we have to have, that we all have the same mind, is not the mind of the world. Paul says this in Colossians. He says, set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are of the earth. In Romans, he says this, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such a harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. If you remove the in accord with Christ Jesus, you know better than any of the groups that are saying, let's be tolerant, let's be complicit, let's allow all these different thoughts and ideas into the church, and then we will find unity in some kind of external formalization of that. That's not the unity that Paul is talking about. Unity that Paul is talking about is oneness in Christ. Christ and a group of people who are of the same mind but that same mind is the mind of Christ and when someone with the mind of the world comes into that group then there is discord then there is a break in the unity because they're not having the same mind which is the mind of Christ well he goes on and it's pretty much the same kind of an idea having the same love obviously we know where the love that we have for each other comes from it's not our love. We, didn't, we weren't loving each other the way that we do now before we were Christians. It's the love of Christ. We are inundated by the love of Christ. We are filled with the love of Christ. We are given the love of Christ. And if we are going to have unity, it needs to be the love of Christ that actually holds us together. The word is agape, the agape love, the kind of passionate love that, that, that the, the Bible talks about. It is a love that doesn't just sit there and, and, and it's theoretical in, in the way that it is done. It's a love that takes action. It's a love that is manifest in the way that we deal with each other. Paul says in the Galatians, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. In Ephesians, he says, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Agape love is also a love that is, can be fostered, can be augmented by the will. It's, 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 a, it's, it's to strive 
to love each other. And I know this. I know that not everyone's lovable. I know that I'm not lovable on many, many occasions. Ask Kay. I can tell you, she'll tell you. That, you know, we all have our moments, don't we? We all have our times that we're simply not lovable. And yet, so therefore, it's a striving. We have to recognize that even in my failings, Christ loves me. And even in your failings, Christ loves you. And so it's the love of Christ that we need for each other. And if we have that love, then there will be unity. Remove that love and there's not going to be any unity. He goes on and says, being in full accord. Now, that's a very rare word. Um, This is the only place you're going to find it in the New Testament. Um, Again, I'm not quite sure about the ESV's translation here. The word actually means one soul. To, to, to be of one soul. And that's why the New American Standard translates this to be united in spirit. To be united in spirit with a lower lowercase s. So we're not talking about the Holy Spirit at this particular point in time, but the spirit of the church. But guess what, brothers and sisters? Where does the spirit of this church come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is who calls us together. It is His Spirit who's converted us, who has changed our hearts, who has brought us to this place. And so basically, even though it's the Spirit of the church, we are united in the Spirit that the Holy Spirit has given each one of us. Interesting thought. The word means one soul. So we all have the same soul. But before we're saved, we are one soul the world. We are on one soul with the darkness. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians. He says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So we were one soul with the rest of the world. But when we're converted, the Holy Spirit comes and takes the old soul out, puts a new soul in, and then he occupies it and makes his home there. So you have a soul in which the Holy Spirit dwells. I have a soul in which the Holy Spirit dwells. That's the source of our unity. It's the soul, the spirit that is the true spirit of Christ. Paul says to Timothy, by the, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. To the Corinthians, once again, he says, you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you. God's spirit dwells in the soul that he has given us and he dwells in the soul that he has given you. And you know, sometimes our flesh gets in the way and it's the flesh that divides us. Quite often people will come to me for counseling and they either have a spouse or they, they, they may have a child who is, who is really struggling and seems to, 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 to be making bad decisions. And one of the first things I will ask them, are you certain that they are saved? Do you know that they have a redeemed soul given to them by the Holy Spirit? And if they say yes, I will say then you need to appeal to the redeemed soul. Don't try to fight the flesh because the flesh is going to fight you tooth and nail. But if that person truly has a new soul and the Holy Spirit lives in that soul, then appeal to the redeemed soul. Because that's the quickest way to get down to the the part of that person that's going to actually listen to you. Um, So brothers and sisters, oneness only comes. And this is what Paul is making the point over and over again. Oneness only comes in Christ. It is oneness with Christ. So far we have seen the mind of Christ. We have seen the heart of Christ. And now we're seeing the spirit of Christ, a soul redeemed by Christ. And the fourth one is um, here, to have the same love being in full accord and of one mind. Now he's not repeating himself, even though the English translation makes it sound like that. He's not saying the same mind now. He's saying of one mind. And, and the, 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 the meaning here is to have the same purpose, to, to have the same goals. This morning we talked about teleology, right? We talked about moving towards a goal with purpose. And, and, and that, that when Jesus came, it was God who shot him like an arrow from heaven. And then, boom, he comes and the cross is, his, is where he's going to head. And then he shot us. And, and, and we're moving through this world with purpose. And so if I have the purpose of Christ, 
And, and I have picked that purpose up to seek and save the lost, to stomp on the head of the serpent, to, to live according to the ethical standards of the kingdom. If that is my purpose and that is your purpose, then we have unity. If you have another purpose that's not the purpose of Christ, then we don't have unity. So once again, it is all about uh, being, uh, it, it, being unified with Christ. Otherwise, brothers and sisters, there are an awful lot of social clubs out there that have all kinds of unity because they're all on the same page and they all think the same way, but they are not unity, unified in Christ. It's oneness with Christ that Paul is saying brings the unity of the church. Well, then he has these, these two sentences that build upon that. As far as what truly brings unity to the church, look in verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Both of these verses are a negative-positive pair, meaning what he's going to do is first tell you what not to do, and then he's going to tell you what to do. And it just tends to emphasize the message. The first thing that he says is do not do anything out of selfish ambition. William Hendrickson asked the question, how is it possible that a church can have unity if everyone in the church is seeking their own selfish ambition? To, 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 to seek selfish ambition is to exalt oneself. It is to put oneself on the pedestal, to put oneself in one's life. That is what, what, what that, that uh, selfish ambition is. Interestingly enough, if you think about just a couple of weeks ago when Paul was talking about those, those pastors who he wasn't upset with uh, because they were undermining him, but they were at least sharing the gospel, this is what he said about them. The former proclaimed Christ out of Selfish ambition, same, same word. That's an example of that exalting of oneself. Boy, I tell you what, if there is one thing that Jesus warned us about as Christians, it's exalting ourselves. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The Pharisees, one of the great identifying facts about a Pharisee was that they exalted themselves. Once again, Jesus says, Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. You are doing what you are doing out of selfish ambition. Brothers and sisters, there's no way that someone who has their own agenda is not going to bring disunity when put into the midst of a bunch of people who don't. And so, therefore, that is uh, one, of the, one of the major causes of disunity. The second one is conceit. And, and, and I like the way that the King James translates this word. It's a word we don't use very much anymore, but it is so descriptive. It is vainglory, okay? It's to glorify yourself with vanity. The word actually means empty or, or, or worthless, it is to place yourself on a pedestal when you have absolutely no reason to do so. It is an empty self-image. It, 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 is, it is vain glory. So Paul says, don't do this, but humble yourself. Live a life of humility. And then he tells us to do something that is just difficult for us to do. He says, consider other people more significant than yourself. And if you're honest with yourself, that's a tough one. That's hard. I, I, I can love my brothers and sisters. I can get, want, want to give. I, I want to help. But do I actually put their life more significant than my own? You know, I've told this story before. When Before I was a Christian, my sphere of significance was like a rubber band that was so tight around my waist I could barely get my own hands through it. Then I got married, and I had to put my wife in there because she's significant to me now. And we had our children, and I had to put the children in there because they're significant, but that rubber band is still super tight, and then I got saved. And all of a sudden, that rubber band just starts stretching, and people I didn't even know are all of a sudden inside my rubber band of significance. And then it's not just the people in my church or the people in my community. It's the people in the places that I'm going to serve on the mission field in Haiti and Peru and Ecuador and all different kinds of places. All of a sudden, I've got this whole group of people in my sphere of significance. But it is so hard to put 
their significance above mine. At least they're in my sphere. But do I exalt them before me? Well, if Jesus can do that, if the Son of God can be humble and make your life more significant than his so that he will die for you and he will take your sins upon himself, then that's a good reason for us to. And boy, what a source of unity that is. And finally, he says, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. This is just downright un-American, folks. The American way is that you go to work and you make as much money as you can, and you salt it away, and you invest it well, and then when you reach my age, actually younger than my age, you stop work and play, right? That's what you do for the rest of your life. Did you know that there's no retirement in the kingdom of God? There is no such thing as retirement in the kingdom of God. But the American way is to just to focus on my own self-interest. Boy, Jesus told us a parable about that, didn't he? That parable of the rich fool, remember that one? The guy who had that bumper crop and all that extra food and all the stuff, and he didn't think about anyone else. He kept it all for himself. And that's when God said to him, you fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Okay, so the flip side of that is to... Consider the self-interest of of others. And and the way Paul says it, he doesn't say that you don't consider your own self-interest. He says, but also the interest of others. Also, we think about each other. We think of our needs. We think of our harm, our our hurts. Uh, We pray for each other. When when we have good times, we, we laugh. When we have bad times, we cry. We are connected with each other. Your interest or my other, my interest. Your interest or mine and mine are yours. That is the foundation of unity within the church. So that's Paul's formula. That, that's how Paul establishes that this is the way that we're going to be able to overcome the norm and find a church in which we are bound together in the Holy Spirit. But we want to make sure we do it right. Um, John MacArthur ha- had an illustration in his, um, in, in, in his commentary that I really liked. And so I just want to use it because he gave two illustrations of church unity. And um, I I want you to tell me which one is the right one and which one is the wrong one. He said church unity can can be one of two things. It can be like a bag of marbles or it can be like a magnet in the midst of metal shavings. When I was a kid, I used to play marbles. Anybody play marbles here when they were a kid? I used to have a little bag of marbles in a cloth bag with, you know, a string that tied it tight. And the way, I don't know how you played when you were a kid, but the way I played is you would go out and you'd play your marbles and you'd draw the circle and, you know, you'd, you'd try to knock the marbles out of the circle. And if you won, you got to choose one of your opponent's marbles, okay? And you get to add them to your bag. So what happens is you end up with a bag full of all different kinds of marbles, all different shapes from different sources, different colors, different construction. Everything was different about your marbles. An eclectic bag of marbles, right? Now, in one sense, if we look at the church, then we can say, well, that's a good thing in the sense that the body has many different parts and there's a lot of different people that are in there, but not not the way Paul means this, not the way that MacArthur meant this, because you see, these are a bunch of people with different ideas, different hearts, different spirits, different purposes, and yet they're all held in the same bag by something that's external, something that holds them together. I I, I hate to say that we are part of a denomination that cries for unity all the time, but they are held together by an external bag. They are, the denomination is, and the problem is what they have done is they have brought people into that bag. Some people ordain women as pastors and elders and deacons, other people don't, like us. Some people want to invite the uh, LGBTQ uh, 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 agenda into the church. They support same-sex marriage. They even have uh, partners uh, in same-sex marriage that are, that are serving as deacons in the church. Others find that to be an abomination. 
The, some people want uh, the, the children who are uh, uh, baptized but not professing to take the Lord's Supper, even though Paul warns us against that. Other people think that's an egregious sin. Some people are almost Kuyperian, social gospel in the way that they approach it. They talk about the gospel a lot, but they don't ever share or talk about the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet all these people are in the same bag, and that bag is the denomination. Well, what happens to a bag of marbles when you're walking across a tile floor and your bag falls apart? <sighs> marbles go every direction. That's not unity. Brothers and sisters, that's the type of unity that most churches are striving for. All these disparate ideas, not the same heart, mind, soul, and spirit, but different ones, and we're going to tie them together, and we're going to be tolerant, we're going to, to, to be accepting, and that somehow is unity. That's not the kind of unity Paul's talking about. Paul's talking about the other kind of unity, a magnet in the midst of Metal shavings. I'm going to show my age here. Um, anybody remember Willy Willy? <laughs> you know that you can still buy Willy Willy. Willy Willy was a little game that kids in my day used to play. It was a, just a cardboard, piece of cardboard with the face of a funny looking man on it that had absolutely no hair. And then over the top of that, there was a little plastic, uh, uh, um, um, about a quarter of an inch off of the, the, the surface of, the, uh, of the, um, the cardboard, and it was filled with metal shavings. And the whole object of the game is you had this little wand with a magnet on it. And what you would do is you would put it over the shavings and then carefully move it around to where it was maybe making some sideburns or a mohawk or a Fu Manchu beard on him. And then you would pull the, the, the little wind up and down the metal shavings would, would fall on that place. Can you believe that kids used to play those things for hours? And now they wouldn't look at it, you know, for, for five minutes. But that's the way the church should be, folks like a magnet in the midst of metal shavings. Because you see, if you take a magnet that is strong like the Holy Spirit and it's holding us together and that is the key and you move that magnet around, you throw it around, you can drop it right on that floor and those metal shavings don't go anywhere because it's the magnet that holds them together. That's the unity of the church. That is the only unity of the church because it is Jesus Christ that holds us together. And that is what draws us together. And we need to continue to pursue that oneness in Christ. And if we pursue the oneness in Christ, that is what's going to grow us together. Let me give you kind of just in one form, Paul's formula for church unity. If every man, woman, and child in this church seeks the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ, the spirit of Christ, the purpose of Christ with a soul that has been redeemed by Christ, if they pursue selflessness and humility, putting others before themselves, then we will have unity. But only if that unity is oneness in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would grant us unity. I pray that you would grant this little church to have that kind of unity, that we would recognize that it is only in Christ, his mind, his heart, his spirit, his purpose, a soul changed by him that actually brings about the kind of unity that Paul is talking here. Lord, I know that there is so many reasons for us to find, to divide. Church is, is expert at dividing. But dear Lord, if we are focused on you and, and if we are pursuing you then, Lord, we will find unity because it won't be our unity. It will be yours. And I just pray that for this church, not only today, not only tomorrow, but the third day until we reach our destination. In Christ's name we pray.